This is a record. <laughs> yeah. The Lunenburg Historical Society has never had a crowd of this size. <laughs> Let me ask you, how many members, card-carrying members or life members of the society are here? Lunenburg Historical Society. Oh, well, we have a lot of potential members. <laughs> With programs like this, what could go wrong, really? Well, we're very fortunate tonight. And oh, the rest of you, by the way, you, uh, how come you're here? <laughs> oh, it's the library's, the library's fault? I mean, uh, library's invitation, was it? Yeah. Okay, now I understand. Oh, we're so happy to see you all. We, uh, we're going to have a superb program tonight. Oh, by the way, Martha says she's going to have some cider and stuff right out the door to the right, the little kitchen. Uh, probably after the meeting you might be thirsty. I'm going to have mine at home. That's right, it won't be cider. Anyway, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Bill Lexo. <clears throat> I managed to work through two terms as president of the Historical Society and uh, now serve as the clerk of the corporation. And they put me up here because I've known Sally for mm, years. <laughs> From her days. Uh, working for Brown and Bigelow. Anybody heard of Brown and Bigelow? Calendars and stuff like that, promotional, business promotional. That goes back to the 1960s. I'm getting to that. <laughs> well, that's right, oh, you started when you were 10. Yeah. Anyway, Sally is originally from Leominster, went to Leominster High and Skidmore College. Skidmore College is not in Leominster, but she went there anyway. And then uh, worked as a sales representative in Brown and Bigelow <clears throat> when uh, independent women owned businesses were still relatively rare. As president of the board of directors of the Fitchburg Historical Society, she headed up a capital campaign that resulted in $3 million to enable the, the society to move into the Phoenix building in Fitchburg. How many members of the Fitchburg uh, Historical Society here? Any? Okay, we'll get a couple. Good. This is what we're going to hear about tonight. Although it's titled The Missing Links to the Igor Sikorsky Story, Igor Sikorsky's success can be attributed to the participation and contribution made by Dickinson family and several other local industrialists, but you'll have to read the book to find out. <laughs> you'll be amazed at the major contributions that these people made. Otherwise, Sikorsky aircraft, both fixed wing and helicopters might not even exist today. There's a great deal of Lunenburg significance within this book. After the uh, presentation is complete, uh, Sally and I will be at the table, if it hasn't disappeared, the crowd, uh, up there. So we'll need a little space at the close of the meeting, set up uh, book sales, and uh, price is $24.95 for this book, including signed by Sally. No charge. <laughs> Twenty-four ninety-five. If you like to round off, we'll take twenty-five. Well, I do have some nickels. I made sure to bring nickels. <laughs> Here's the big thing: her contribution in writing this book is going to benefit our society in Lunenburg and Fitchburg as well, because she is taking nothing from the proceeds, but all of the proceeds will be going to those two or three organizations actually. One is the uh, Sikorsky Archives and the Fitchburg 
Historical Society and we, the Lunenburg Society, are the only outlets for the book. You have to buy from one of those three. We get all the proceeds. And thank you so much. Okay? Here she is, Sally Dickinson. Am I testing this? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is it all right? Mm -hmm. Well, Thank you all for coming here tonight. I can't believe there's so many. Um, hear an old lady talk about aviation that she really knew nothing about a while back. It's, a, it's an interesting subject, and I, I think most of you know that it all came from Arnold Dickinson's office. When it was closed, my husband brought home this box of all this old material and a lot of aviation, the pictures and things that you see over there. Uh, a lot of real old manuscripts and blue, uh, whatever you call them, that they draw airplanes on. And, um, this uh, picture, the uh, model of the S-38 plane that was his claim to fame of all times. Um, that all came back and sat in our cellar for 30 years. And when we sold the house and moved to Lewinburg, I thought it was time to look at it and see really what it was all about. And when I did, and I read some of the personal letters from Ada Sikorsky to Arnold Dickinson, and the battles that they went through when they were trying to raise money to build planes, um, it was, it, I was really sort of frightened that I might be stepping on some toes uh, in the Sikorsky company, and uh, luckily, I got a letter just last week, having sent a copy of my book to the Sikorskys, and uh, <coughs> his son Sergey, who is 93 years old, and worked with Igor throughout his career, sent me a personal letter, and it was, dear Sally in parentheses, if I may be so informal. <laughs> I want to thank you for sending me a copy of your fascinating book, Missing Links. It is a very important book, in my opinion. It clarifies the early days of Sikorsky aircraft. There's no doubt in my mind, without the guidance and support of Arnold Dickinson and his Fitchburg friends, Sikorsky aircraft would not have survived the late 1920s. Arnold Dickinson's vision and his confidence in Igor Sikorsky eventually gave birth to the S-38, and like that, they, like they say, the rest is history. Boom, boom. It's not supposed to be there. <coughs> I still remember a weekend visit to Dickinson home as a child and a motorboat ride on the Dickinson Reservoir. It was then that Mr. Dickinson taught me that cannonballing was not the proper way to enter the water. <laughs> After some ten minutes of gentle persuasion, he encouraged me and I was diving head first into the lake. Thank you both for the book. It is both a beloved document and a source of many pleasant memories. Very sincerely yours, Sergei Sikorsky. I was quite charmed, and I really feel pretty comfortable telling you the story. Anyway, um, you found out where we got the information, and I'll show you uh, the cover. Actually, came from uh, the picture of the model was given was uh, taken by Chris Reed. Chris, Trish Reed, who was a local photographer, and um, we decided that the model doesn't do its best by sitting on the table, so we decided to make it fly. And we tied it under our back deck and let the wind blow it. And Chris was on her back on the center taking pictures of the, the old S-38 flying for the last time, probably. 
<laughs> but and then um, our printer, whose name is Tom Pullen. What? Pullen. 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 Yes. Yeah, thank you. And got the Nobel too. He uh, designed the cover. The back of the cover is uh, part of the artwork of a man named Andre Avanov, who was a relative of a Sirk, Sirko, Sirk, Sumatovs, who uh, were very involved with Arnold in in uh, his uh, the whole works, the organization. Um, I have a few pictures of. Look at that. This uh, give you a little idea of some of the the uh, archive material that came through. Uh, we it was it's all brittle. We put it all in acid-free sleeves and put it in three ring binders. There are, there's a a uh, photo album from the Sikorskys. There were two beautiful snapshot al I mean photo albums and. Uh, the Porter's secretary had made from news clips back in the 20s of anything about aviation. And a lot of the pictures that uh, came with the... Uh, the archives, and with pictures. And, um, it was all very exciting and hard to do, and finally, I, when I started looking through the theory and bindings, I just was blown away about how much new information I found about Arnold and about Sikorsky. What a tough time he had, had when he came to America. This is Igor Sikorsky, taken probably in about 1924, 25. He came to America in uh, March 1919, having escaped the Bolsheviks in the revolution in Russia, <laughs> and he had no money. He had had a fairly successful past in Russia. <clears throat> in fact, he had built 75 four-engine four bombers for Russia in World War I. Wow. He was about five feet eight, had a mustache that they said made him kind of have a tighter look. <laughs> he uh, worked and, and combed Rachmaninoff symphonies as he worked. He was a very likable man, a lot of Russian friends, and they were moving in and in droves into uh, Long Island and lower New York. Uh, but I like this picture. He's, he's all dressed up, ready to have his first formal photo. But I looked at his hands. His hands were the hands of a working man. He was on he kept track of everything going on with his airplanes and was not afraid to get dirty with them. Now this is Alex Shumatov and Elizabeth Shumatov. Uh, Alex met uh, Aunt Igor in the uh, Russian church in Long Island and they got to talking and I, I mean, Igor had great plans. He, he came to America and all we had for airplanes were one engine planes, sport planes, open cockpits. And they were used for some deliveries, but mostly, you know, the guys were jumping out of airports and then having fun. Sikorsky's dream was to have, and correctly so, was to have large planes that would deliver people and deliver cargo and mail. But he, he uh, saw a way of doing that. This is his wife, Elizabeth, and uh, she takes a part in this too. This is one of the letters that's written by Shumatov to Arnold. Kind of gives you an idea of what it was like going through this material. It was very <laughs> time-taking and difficult to find a way through it. Uh, but but um, this was a, um, the Hong Falls Power Company that Arnold's father had built. It was one of the single hydroelectric plants in the country. And it was in the area that the Shumatov family had kind of settled. And I think it was this area where Arnold might have met Elizabeth Shumatov. 
and he had gone to her to have his photo painted. She was a was becoming quite a famous portraitist. And she was up in this area where George Innes was had a big beautiful home and entertained the Firestones and the Rockefellers and you know, people were very wealthy and having a wonderful time. So um, this kind of jumps, but uh, Mr. Schumantop and Arnold, and not before this is before Arnold. Schumantop and uh, Igor tried to build this airplane, not in a hangar, because they had no hangar. They didn't have any money. So they built this airplane out in a, in a field on a Woodcock farm, who was one of the lieutenants in the Russian Navy that was a friend of Igor's. And they, they had to, uh, they went to dumps and found tools and bed springs and all the metal materials that they could find to build this airplane. Finally, the winter was coming in and they found an old dilapidated hangar on Roosevelt Field where they worked on the plane. And finally, it emerged as the S-29 and no one could believe that they could do this with the tools that they didn't have and the parts that they didn't have and the money they didn't have. And Arnold had heard about this and uh, he was having his portrait done by Elizabeth and uh, knew that they didn't have money. His father had just sold this big plant up in the hills and had some money and so Arnold said, my father and I will help you find factory facilities and back you with a hundred thousand dollars of capital. And they started out um, trying to sell this S-29 to make some capital to build another airplane, a larger airplane. But no one would buy it, so they rented it to a man who uh, put advertising on it, drove, flew it all over the country. People loved it. It helped 24 people. It was safe because it had two engines, but no one would buy it. And you know, that was because he was a Russian. It, this was the time when there was a strong immigration law there again. But um, um, anyway, that finally. Finally, uh, this man sold it to, uh, what was his name? The guy that ran Hell, the Hell's Angels. <laughs> and he, he made it into a German bomber and then he demolished it. Yes, crashed it. And of course, said that the plane was wonderful. And it had never had a crash in its life, but that was it. So Arnold went on and he needed, obviously, he needed money. And these are the people that I don't want to help to um, back Igor Sikorsky and start a corporation which had uh, an endowment of $1 million. These are the people, Arnold Dickinson, who had an inheritance from his father, as well as the uh, hydroelectric company, Charles Dickinson, who's also a real estate developer, developer who owned uh, the hydroelectric power company. Mm -hmm. Alvin Simons from Simons Saw and Steel, an international manufacturer of steel saws and similar products. Milton Cushing, whose father Joseph, owned the Cushing Grain Mill and several real, real retail stores selling farm products. Bigelow Crocker, Bato Crocker, and C.T. Crocker, the third, owners of Crocker Burbank Paper Company, nationally known paper manufacturer, and George R. Wallace, Jr., owner of Pittsburgh Paper Company, manufacturer of specialty papers. But first, they started to try to build small planes, or design small planes, but Igor decided that was not, they were not successful, they would not have uh, built a good company using foreign motors, there were no uh, American engines available at a decent price. And so he decided he would build a large plane. And he thought he had money with all of his backing. 
And at that time, here's a man who uh, started a, the Artigue uh, Challenge, which was going to be a race between New York and Paris. And the first plane to go across the ocean would receive $25,000 and all of the notoriety that went with it. And uh, so there are other plane manufacturers working in that. But uh, Igor decided that they would go for it. Of course, they still didn't have any money. Uh, Shumatov was after him all the time to go and go out and find <coughs> some money. I need it for the payroll. I need it for parts. I need it for this and that. And I always said, finally, you know, I said, I'm really not into keeping your plant working. I came on because I want to get you a factory and some capital. But Shumatov said, unless we get this plane going, there's no need of having the factory and the capital. So, they worked at it and had their battles. They had trial runs that were very successful. They sent telegrams from the um, trial runs. Is from Sikorsky Funk and Snotty, who was the American representative on the planes. This was a picture that that uh, the workers in the factory insisted on having taken of. Michael Gluberat at the left, Alan Sikorsky, and Igor Sikorsky, I mean, yeah, Adam Dickinson, and Igor Sikorsky. And uh, that was at the first big run of the plane. Uh, this, these were the, the big shots that were on the plane. Gluberat, Snozzi. This is Rene, Captain Rene Funk, who was a Russian, and he was a French pilot that had come and was insisting on being the pilot for the plane that was going from New York to France. And um, all was going well. Igor knew that they weren't, they didn't have enough test flights. He knew there were some soft spots in the plane. But they, everyone was so eager to go across and get that plane in the air that it, it uh, never got off the ground. It flew into the end of the ditch because of some crazy fault with the landing gear. Then, three months later, little Charlie Lindbergh <coughs> hopped into his little plane and made the flight and won the prize and all the notoriety that went with it. And what is surprising is, Igor admired Lindbergh tremendously, what he had done, and uh, they became good friends. And uh, Arnold was not, well, not ruined. He went on further and he decided he would make another large plane and it would be an amphibian. There weren't many airports at the time and so he knew that there, most, near most cities there was some water and that uh, this might be successful. <coughs> well, that was his big step <coughs> to, uh, to fame. It, it, uh, he made, it, he made it very beautiful inside. It was custom, custom designed. These are two of his interior decorators, who happened to be on the left his his um, sister-in-law, uh, Edward's wife. His brother Edward's wife, Natasha. She was from. She was one of the Russians. And the one on the right is uh, Mrs. Porter Dickinson who was my husband's mother. This is one of the interiors that uh, were on the S-38, which is just beautiful. It was designed for Mr. C.A. Whitney, I think. But we had pictures in the uh, archives of several of the interiors that were just gorgeous, uh, gorgeously decorated. Um, at that time, a guy named Warren Tripp was uh, Flying for the Pan American. He had planes for Pan American Airlines trying to make a uh, airline. Uh, he traveled over the islands and into Panama. And uh, so Igor and, and Charles Lindbergh decided they would uh, build a new plane. They got together and they built this gorgeous Yankee Clipper. 
which is for uh, and it was a gorgeous plane. This picture happened to be signed by Higgins, of course, too. It doesn't show. It doesn't show. And with the success of the S-38 and the investors, they were able to build a new factory, which was in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Even though Arnold had traveled all around the <coughs> East Coast trying to find a suitable spot for Igor's uh, ambitious ambitions. But Igor selected this one and the factory stood there. I think people drive by it now and recognize it. And in July of 1929, United Aircraft showed interest in the, the uh, Sikorsky Corporation and bought it and made uh, it a subsidiary, although it kept its name. And Arnold, who was president of Sikorsky at the time, was on the board of directors. And here is Arnold Dickinson, uh, probably taken in 29. Uh, he had become a very personal friend of Igor's, and one of the first things I found when I was going through all these papers were a lot of personal letters back and forth between Sikorsky and Arnold Dickinson. And um, it, there was one, there were a couple of them. <coughs> but, um, uh, in August 19, no, in July of 1929, Sikorsky Aviation Field. Um, on September 30th, 1926, Sikorsky wrote, we would probably not be able at all to keep going without this interest and assistance of yours. <clears throat> and then in August 1946, uh, in answer to a letter that uh, Arnold had written about the first rocket ship to the moon, and Igor uh, had said, Gladly take you on it. Yeah. <laughs> Igor was reminding him. I mean, I was reminding him of it. And, he, and Igor wrote back, "I will gladly reserve a seat for you, although I cannot as yet predict the time of departure." <laughs> <coughs> this is Adam's father, C.P. Dickinson, Charles Ford Dickinson, and he is the man who built the lake beside behind his home. It now is known as Hickory Hills. And I think that many of you who are from Hickory Hills, yeah. anyone want to hear about the building of the lake? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You do. Okay. In 1914, CP's dream was to create an inland lake behind his home, which he would eventually self-call Dickinson Lake. He was, he was eminently qualified to, to uh, pursue the plan, particularly, excuse me, the eyes, because of the, uh, his, his intensive work and administrative work involving the hydroelectric company. His calculations regarding the acreage and volume of the proposed body of water <clears throat> and the method of properly flooding his, his envisioned vision site were painstakingly precise. Until he sold his Hawk Falls Power Company in 1920, his lake project centered on acquiring the acreage mostly block type property. <clears throat> He commissioned his local caretaker, Frank Warner, to acquire the necessary parcels, followed by an extensive process of saving the timber so to produce about 1.5 million board feet to provide for damming the Malthus Brook. The, the uh, above, uh, the advent of World War I caused him to temporarily pause. Then in 1925, a sawmill was erected and local men with horse teams hauled the wood. Malthus Brook was dammed by a one half mile wooden dam. And in 1926, a runoff from melting snow succeeded in filling more than 200 acres of the newly formed lake. 
dynamiting the many floating pieces of bug that had floated to the surface finished the task. Andre Warner, who was responsible for a reforestry project which provided an abundance of Norway pond, excellent underbrush, and eventually first-rate hunting acreage. In 1931, a visitor to the pond wrote, this beautiful pond cover, covers, by calculations of engineers, some 300 acres, including the various islands within its limits. This is about the three times as large as the area of Willow Lake. It required vision to see and see such a beauty spot in the midst of the 2,500 acres of land, <coughs> which, which is its crowning feature. The writer goes on to say that it is a pleasure to drop to those who view it from a road that fringes it, from the surface of its waters, and from the air above it. It is a beautiful lake. Many of you will live on it, I think. In addition to the completion of the lake, made it convenient for the taking off and landing of Dickinson's and his, his guest amphibious aircraft. This is a picture of the S-38 landing on the lake. Um, he also had a landing strip on the other side uh, of Northfield Road, which you can see is in here. Um, Turkey Hill Road bisects Northfield Road where the uh, old Dickinson home was at the curb and the Arnold Dickinson was right there in the middle of his home. This is a picture of the uh, S32, I think, that was uh, down at the Fitchburg Airport and was advertised as it's uh, Alpine Airways. They could sail. They had a Boston office, a New York office, a Pittsburgh office, <laughs> and they would land on, on um, I think it was especially on going up to camping areas and the rivers up north and in Maine and Quebec. And then here's old George Wallace when we finally came to the helicopter. He was right there with me. Uh, I wanted to say what the, uh, the meaning of the whole um, scenario with this story was that with failure you find success. And there were so many failures in, in Sikorsky's story that you wonder how he kept going. But he did, and people supported him, and that was wonderful. And I want you to end that with this. And I hope that you will all be interested in buying the book and supporting the Lunenburg Historical Society and go home with a good message in your hearts. Thank you for coming.